Hello, and welcome to Objective Health. I am Doug, uh, with my co-host today, Tiffany. Hello. And in the background, our tech guy, Damien. Hello. And with us today, we have a very special interview um, with uh, Professor Denis Rancourt. Uh, Denis Rancourt was a professor of physics at the University of Ottawa for 23 years, attaining the highest academic rank of tenured full professor. Dr. Rancourt has been an invited a plenary keynote or a special session speaker at major scientific, scientific conferences some 40 times. He has published over 100 research papers in leading peer-reviewed scientific journals in areas of physics, chemistry, geology, materials science, soil science, and environmental science. He has made fundamental scientific discoveries in the areas of environmental science, measurement science, soil science, biogeochemistry, theoretical physics, alloy physics, magnetism, and planetary science. Since 2014, Dr. Rancor is a researcher at the Ontario Civil Liberties Association. He's a frequent media commentator with recent notable appearances on Mercola.com and DigiDebates. Uh, you can also find a number of his articles and papers republished on SOT.net. Professor Rancor, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys, Doug and Tiffany. It's a pleasure to be here. So you're, uh, you've been publishing. Maybe um, if our uh, audience uh, is familiar with you at all, they're probably familiar with um, a lot of the work that you've uh, been publishing and uh, video appearances you've been doing about masks um, and the science, um, the hard science, really, on masks and uh, debunking a lot of the narratives that have been going uh, around on that. And we might have a chance to get into some of that stuff later in the show, but I think to start with, we were going to talk more about your more recent research on um, all-cause mortality um, and looking at the, the numbers and what it actually tells us about what's really going on here with this whole COVID episode. So um, maybe you can en en enlighten our viewers a little bit here on what you've been working on. Okay. Well, no, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm more known for the masks. Uh, the masks work has been read millions of times and there's been a lot of interviews about it and so on. Um, but I think what's more vitally important is, you know, what, what really happened? Mm -hmm. what, what has been this COVID episode? And how can we be sure of our understanding and our interpretations of what really just happened and is still unfolding? Uh, so I've been concentrating on that. And as a scientist, I first looked at, well, how can you tell? If this is truly a virulent pathogen and we're in the middle of a pandemic, there should be deaths. Mm -hmm. Let's agree on that. And so let's look at deaths. And you, it turns out you can't look at deaths that are attributed to have a certain cause because there's too much bias in politics in attributing the cause of death. Mm -hmm. And epidemiologists have known this forever. That's why they look at all-cause mortality. And especially in the, in the mid-latitude countries that have, you know, what, what, what you might call a proper winter, uh, all-cause mortality is very cyclical. There's a, a large amplitude cyclical variation. It's much higher in the winter than in the summer. And so uh, we need to look at that data. Now, um, I guess... By studying this, and I'm, I'm, I'm really reading a lot of the scientific paper, and I'm an, I'm an expert reader about science, and I, I really know measurement techniques. All, mm -hmm. I, I used to teach at the graduate level all the different kinds of measurement methods that, that, that exist in science and, and how to use them and how you do error calculation, how you propagate error and, and statistics. And I've written research papers on Bayesian statistics and so on. Okay. So I know how to read science and I'm looking at this and what I'm finding is that the virologists are, are, having, are, are, look, are having tunnel vision, mm -hmm. okay? They, they, they think in terms of the molecular mechanisms of infection by a new strain of a virus and they're very limited in their outlook in this way. Whereas the epidemiologists have a much broader perspective and they look at population dynamics. They look at uh, the death and the spread of a disease in a population. They, they're, so they're using geographical and historical concepts, and they, they have a much broader understanding of what's going on, I find. Um, and then also, um, the medical researchers and biologists and, and the people who were really concerned about health and survival and treatment 
know a lot more about the human body and how it responds to disease than do the virologists per se in their little specialization. So for example, it's really well known that psychological stress is a huge determinative factor in whether or not you're going to be particularly vulnerable to a viral respiratory disease. And this is, this is uh, completely determined and these are not subtle effects. Um, so there's the work of a Professor Cohen who's been working on this for 35 years. And he has demonstrated with, with uh, rigorous experiments and, um, that people, depending on the level of psychological stress that they're being subjected to in their lives that they're feeling, uh, will be far more susceptible to, to being uh, violently attacked by a given virus that is, that is around than if you're not being subjected to this stress. And then there's the addition layer that the effect of stress on diseases and these, this particular disease as well is even greater if you're elderly. So elderly people, uh, and there's a lot of science, there's more and more, not enough science on this particular point, but there's more and more science showing that um, the, 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 the stress as a liability is much, much higher for an elderly person than for a not so elderly person. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, real scientific health factors that the virologists basically ignore. They think in terms of virulence of the particular strain of the virus, and they have a very limited view in, in those terms. So I'm starting to see the big picture in this way. And um, when you look at the history of, of, of deaths, um, oh, it's asking me something here. Yes, when, when, when you look at the history of, of, of deaths, as I said, it's cyclical. So maybe we could, I had prepared a slide, I guess it's slide three in the, no, slide two, I think in the PowerPoint. Well, let's go to slide one first. You guys there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just take okay. a second. Okay, no problem. So this is, I wanna show you some uh, figures from this latest paper that I did in collaboration with uh, two co-authors, uh, two scientists, uh, Medine Baudin and Jeremy Mercier. And it's, it's entitled Evaluation of the Virulence of SARS-CoV-2 in France from All Cause Mortality from 1946 to 2020. And we also looked at the United States and Canada as comparison points. So I think this, this is our most recent paper. Now, if we go to slide two, it shows you all cause mortality as a function of time on a bi-month basis for France from 1946 to the present. And you see these peaks and the peaks occur at, in the winter and they, they vary widely from winter to winter um, because the total amount of deaths in a given winter can, can vary a lot. They used to vary more when uh, general health level in the population after the second world war was not so good and as mortality dropped and uh, general health status increased, the, the variation from winter to winter is not as big as it used to be. And we get into the, 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 the latest years there like that. Now, if we go to the next slide, there's a blow up of the latest years. And what you see therefore is now we're, we're looking at, I forget, 19, uh, 1994 to the present basically. Um, so, you see some anomal two anomalous peaks that I'm pointing out here in this thing. Um, one is in 2003, August, there was a huge heat wave that hit Europe and France, particularly in Paris, and killed some 15,000 elderly people who were vulnerable to having their systems more affected uh, by this heat wave than others. And so that peak shows up in a very unusual place in terms of the usual cycle, it shows up in August, and that's that, that first arrow. The next anomaly, all the other peaks are the usual winter burden peaks. They occur, they're, they're centered usually on the beginning of January, and they last many weeks, and you go down to a trough in the summer. Uh, and those troughs uh, are pretty much at the same place and, and, and their position, their height, if you like, in terms of numbers of deaths per month uh, varies very uh, gradually compared to the heights of the peaks, the winter peaks. So the next anomaly 
is what we have been calling the COVID peak. And that's the other arrow there, which is a very sharp peak that occurs later in these in this cycle than has ever occurred in all the data that we have for all the countries that we have. There's never been a sharp peak like this that happens so late in the uh, cycle of these deaths. And it happens synchronously. You, you can turn off the graph now if you want for a little minute. Uh, but this, so this, this so-called COVID peak is, is unusual because it's very narrow. It only lasts four, four or so weeks in terms of its half width at, at, at half maximum. Uh, it's full width at half maximum. And it happens very late in the cycle. So it happens synchronously at the same time everywhere where it does occur, which is it starts to shoot up immediately after the pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization. Mm. This is, this is quite remarkable. And the other remarkable thing about this peak is that it is completely absent in some jurisdictions, in some countries, even if they're geographically right next to another jurisdiction, that peak can be completely absent or it can be very intense, very large. Uh, and it can vary in its relative intensity um, from country to country or jurisdiction to jurisdiction or state to state in the United States. So this is a, a clear sign. If we go to, if we go to one of the next graphs um, in my, let me see, if we go to slide number five, I wanna show you more of these all cause mortality cycles for recent years. This is for two provinces in Canada. So we've got Ontario on top there and Quebec at the bottom in a darker line. And we see this very sharp COVID peak at the very end there, you see that. And you'll notice that the two curves are fingerprints of each other. These are, these are the two most populous provinces and they're side by side geographically in Canada. And um, they're, they're very similar in many regards and their epidemiology uh, fingerprint, if you like, all cause mortality on a bi week basis here is, is just the same, except when you get to this so-called COVID peak, uh, which is this very sharp feature, feature that is very high in Quebec and not so high in Ontario, mm -hmm. okay? None of the other features in the curve are that dramatically different in intensity. But this, this peak um, can be completely absent or very intense. So those features combine, the fact that it's so light in the cycle, that it's synchronous everywhere with, with what the governments were doing because they were told to do so by the World Health Organization, and that it can be absent or not from one jurisdiction to another, led me to, to conclude in, in a paper about, in a first paper about this that, this, that those mortalities had to be due to the interventions that were occurring, not uh, an uninterrupted normal evolution of a viral respiratory disease, okay? So, then we looked at, just to give you a sense for how variable that so-called COVID peak is, if we go to slide six now, slide six is a map of the United States mm. where we have looked at these curves for each of the states in the United States. And we looked if there was a presence of a COVID peak, whether it was intense or whether it was completely absent. And what we find is in the green and dark green, there is no COVID peak. Mm -hmm. There is no anomaly in the all-cause mortality. That feature is just not there. Whereas in the light gray to dark gray uh, states, you have the anomaly and the darker gray you are, the more intense it is, such as in the state of New York. So it, it, it's dramatically different, even though these states are side by side or for the same uh, nation and so on. So that peak, I came to conclude is an, is artificial. We can we can take the slide down now if you want. Um, so that that's an artificial uh, peak that uh, tells us that uh, something very unusual has occurred. And so I we started researching my co-authors and I and 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 I earlier on as well. You know what what could have caused this sudden acceleration of deaths that then crashes very quickly, that gives you this very narrow peak at that time. And uh, we, we've come to believe that what, if you 
close in and isolate elderly people in their care homes mm -hmm. and you don't allow them to see their families or any visitors, in a lot of cases, they can't even get out of bed. They can't even meet each other. They can't even walk around in the halls. You basically put them in a very confined isolation. Um, and the staff are stressed out wearing rubber gloves and, and masks and so on. And if they have access to the media, it's all about this deadly uh, right. pandemic. Uh, so you're going to be inducing extreme psychological stress on these elderly people that is going to make them more susceptible than ever to being highly affected by any, any seasonal virus of this type that causes a respiratory disease. And in addition to that, you've closed the institution. So you're not allowing the air to circulate. You're not opening the windows or doors. Mm -hmm. So the aerosol particles that transmit this disease are in suspension in the air. They're part of the fluid air and <clears throat> they're maintained in the building. And uh, so, eventually any infected person, it'll spread to everyone, especially if you're not uh, aerating the place and so on. So those situations would have caused uh, an extreme high number of deaths in those institutions. Um, that's our conclusion. So for example, um, and I, I, I could compare uh, Sweden uh, with its neighbors, uh, Finland and Norway. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe we could show the map that I had planned. Um, okay, so you've got um, Sweden in the middle. So you've got the, the sequence there, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Finland that are right there, side by side, very similar countries. Um, it turns out that Sweden has a COVID peak, or a, you know, a reasonably strong COVID peak. And the other two countries on either side do not at all have this feature. So what happened? Uh, you, you, naively, you might think, we, we can take that slide down now if you want, but naively you might think, um, well, Sweden had a lockdown, there you go. Uh, sorry, did not have a lockdown, so there you go. Mm. Actually, it's the, it's, we, we believe that, that that is not what happened. What we think is that it's not about the general population lockdown, whether or not you're going to have a lot of deaths in this COVID peak, but it's about how you treat your elderly and what the structure of the care homes is like in, your, in the jurisdiction and how, what's the population in those care homes and when you lock them in like this, okay? So that, that's what we're finding is that that's what determined how many of these elderly were killed in this way within that sharp COVID peak. And so uh, Sweden has double the population of the other two countries, is more urbanized and has, uh, we're looking into this now, but it, uh, in the first look at the information is that there's a more extended large care homes facilities network, okay? And they did isolate their elderly in this way. And government officials have said that they they did not do the best they could with their elderly people. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with masks and general population lockdown and everything to do with locking in and causing psychological stress in the elderly, we believe. That's the conclusion we're coming to. So now having said all that, I should add that even when you integrate all the deaths in that sharp COVID peak, if you look at the total winter deaths, including the COVID peak, it's not so much greater than you normally would have, mm. even in the jurisdictions that have fairly large COVID peaks, okay? So no matter how you slice it, this, is, this was not a very virulent uh, pathogen. So I, I'd like to um, demonstrate that with my final slide, which is slide 13 in the PowerPoint presentation there. And this is for France again. And so what I've graphed here is uh, the winter burden mortality. So the integrated deaths during the winter um, as a percentage of the total mortality for that cycle year um, as a function of time starting in 1946 to the present. And you see the very last point there is, is this recent cycle. Um, and it is barely noticeable. I mean, statistically, it is not significantly higher than what has been happening for the last 10 years or more. Mm -hmm. So there used to be more variations after the Second World War, very intense variations. Um, 
you you and and there's these oscillations from year to year because if you if I may use the word call many of the vulnerable people in a particular winter then there are less vulnerable people to that can die in the following winter and so on you can start to interpret and understand these things and then in in latter in in, in the latter decade or so the variations are not as great and you can see there that even including the quite large COVID peak that occurred in France. France is one of the five European countries said to be most hit by COVID-19. Um, the, the mortality is not, the overall mortality is not statistically different than it, than it typically is. And that is the general rule everywhere. So there has not been uh, a kind of, you know, a meteorite didn't hit the earth. Uh, the Black Plague did not invade the plant, the humanity. Nothing like that happened, no matter what people did. But there is that sharp COVID peak, which is a clear signature of institutionally causing deaths of elderly people in care homes, we believe. So that's the conclusion of our research up to now. And we're continuing this research in detail with the, each of the European countries, uh, Canada and the United States. That, that's where we're at. So. I'm sorry to report that jurisdictions have literally caused the deaths by the way that they enforce their treatment of elderly people in many, many jurisdictions. That's what happened. Wow. So, I mean, basically you're saying that the, this, this isn't a unusually a killer virus in some way. There was no plague. This wasn't, um, and you know, <clears throat> basically the consequence of um, treating it like it was is what actually led to the deaths. Yeah, treating, isolating the people like they did. Uh, treatment is another story. There's mm. some extra deaths because they use ventilators in hospitals and things like that. But those are, those are additional effects, and they're very serious. Whenever, whenever the state or the medical establishment kills a person when it didn't need to. It's a terrible thing, but they're, I believe that even though they're large numbers, they're relatively small compared to the mass of deaths that occurred uh, in, in that COVID peak. Like in France, it's uh, some 30,200 people who were, who were, that we can quantify with accuracy that, that are part of this COVID peak mortality that would have been killed in this way. And, and that's right, there, is not, uh, there was not a specific virus that was particularly virulent. Uh, and also, you know, from winter to winter, there's always many viruses acting all the time simultaneously. Whenever uh, patients who are ill are analyzed for what's infecting them, you, uh, researchers typically find a host of several viruses that they can detect hmm. uh, that, are, that, are co, that are co-active and co-infecting the person. So the the virologists kind of cartoon view that there's a new strain all of a sudden and that that is the thing causing the deaths in this winter season and so on. That is a cartoonish view of things. Actually, there's hundreds of viruses that live within our bodies uh, constantly, that are constantly evolving, that are constantly there. And um, um, there, this winter burden mortality is largely a result of this coexistence between viruses that cause these respiratory diseases and and us as as humans and it's been there forever and we've co-evolved with it so and and there are many researchers there are researchers science that 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 um has argued that this coexistence is important that we need to keep um educating our immune system that we need to keep fine-tuning and and co-evolving our immune system because these uh, viruses and also microbes of all kinds, they, they uh, mutate quickly, uh, they evolve quickly, and so we have to keep up. And it is uh, kind of a crazy suicidal mission to try to live in a sterile environment. Yeah. Uh, there, is, there, is, there is science that argues uh, uh, very, very convincingly that uh, the sterile environment is sterile environments in in urban centers is is causing us as as species as a species a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, so, considering your research, uh, have you noticed any positive effects, uh, uh, like any changes in either on the local or the countrywide level on any policies as far as the whole lockdown goes concerning nursing home residents? Have you noticed that anyone is actually uh, heated? Um, yeah, right? there, there are some small things happening. For example, there's an, 239 scientists wrote uh, a letter and published it as a paper also to the World Health Organization mm. telling them, uh, you know, please stop. You know, the, the, the transmission mechanism is not limited to droplets and contact surfaces. Please stop being so ridiculous. I mean, they didn't say it in these words, but that's basically what it meant. You know, they said, you have to consider aerosol particles. You know, those really fine particles that are in suspension in the air and that don't settle and that are part of the fluid air and that you can't stop with a mask as, and, and that you can't stop in any way and that they completely fill the volume in institutions and places where there are people. You know, you have to consider that uh, World Health Organization and uh, please do. Here we are, a bunch of experts in many different fields and we've come to that conclusion. So if you really want to do something to help, vulnerable people and the elderly, basically this is what they said, you have to think about how to ventilate these buildings. Mm. Uh, you have to, yeah, and they, and they drew pictures about why ventilation is important and so on. And in that entire article that was extremely authoritative, um, they didn't once mention masks. <laughs> I think that mm. that's not an accident. Uh, there, Masks are useless in a disease that is transmitted by fine aerosol particles that are completely in suspension in air. Uh, because, well, you know, I've written a lot about this, but when you, when you wear a mask, the, it's 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 never perfect. There there is there is never a complete seal with your face. There's always a low impedance route for the air to come in and out, and uh, one of these aerosol particles is enough, in in probability wise, to infect you. So this, this idea that if you reduce the number of droplets that are being spit out be, pe by people, that you're reducing the load and that therefore people are less likely to get the disease is complete nonsense because the infectious dose is so small that there, it's not a question of uh, being proportional to the number of droplets that people are spitting out. If right. there's aerosol particles in the air, there's lots of them, any one can infect you uh, with a, uh, uh, in a probabilistic way. And therefore there is not this relationship between load as imagined by them in terms of droplets and uh, chance of being infected. That's just a, a, a nonsensical, non-scientific invention. So, you know, and that, that brings us into the work I've been doing on masks. Mm -hmm. So basically there's that realization that uh, the air management in buildings is, is important in terms of transmission. And there is some talk more and more about uh, the importance of psychological stress. For example, Professor Cohen that I mentioned earlier wrote a review of his work in the context of COVID-19 that was published recently and uh, re-emphasized how important psychological stress and also social isolation are in terms of disease and this particular disease in particular. So there's a little bit of an opening. People are, um, these people are getting that work published, but it's in an ocean of often useless and, and stupid writings, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, so, I mean, scientists are building their careers uh, they see it as a bonanza that they can publish papers quickly as soon as mm -hmm. there's COVID-19 in the title. Um, there's a lot of uh, quick stuff that's being said, just going along. If you, if you have a nice phrase like oh, the vaccine will save us, or, you know, of mm -hmm. course, the best way to solve this is with a vaccine, then of course, it's just going to sail through. Um, so uh, have there been positive things? I think one of the positive things is that the governments have gone so far, and this is so insane and so reckless, and it was so murderous that some people are noticing and have noticed. Mm -hmm. And those people who have seen this, they can't forget it, and they're not going to um, drop it. 
they're going to find every occasion they can to bring this up, to try to get it corrected. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's literally a crime against humanity what was done yeah. on the global yeah. scale, and uh, it that people, many people, many researchers, many observers have noticed, and have taken note and are are angry about it, and so that there is a lot of that in the background, and hopefully that will be enough to change policies and um, disarm the World Health Organization that is funded by. Uh, huge private capital, and uh, di di disarm a lot of this propaganda as well. If we can start to demonstrate how ridiculous this propaganda is, you know, uh, and I've, I wrote a paper just on the propaganda related to masks, where all the health officials will say, there is growing evidence that masks help. Yeah. Well, you know, I wrote an article well, just on that little mantra that they keep repeating. Okay, what is the growing evidence you're talking about? Where, where is it? What is it? It's complete. It's a complete lie. Uh, all the randomized controlled trials with verified outcomes, and more and more of them are coming out in the last decade, have all consistently shown that there is no uh, measurable, detectable advantage in terms of reducing risk of getting a viral uh, a respiratory disease by wearing a mask versus not wearing a mask. It, it, it's, it's uniform. So yeah, some of those papers might say it might still be a good idea to wear masks after they have rigorously concluded from their randomized <laughs> control trial that there is no detectable advantage. Yeah, that's true. But that doesn't mean that their, that their data is uh, any different from having demonstrated that there's no measurable advantage. So um, yeah, the benefit of all this is that it, it's sad, but the, one of the only benefits is that it's, it's so insane that some people are, have noticed and have been very perturbed by how insane it all is. Unfortunately, That's it seems like it's still the minority though. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is a minority, but it's a very determined minority. It's mm. one that is demonstrating in the streets more and more. The, the rallies and the protests are bigger and bigger. Uh, I was at the protest in Ottawa recently. There were 4,000 people. The mainstream media said 500. Well, I know what 500 looks like. I, <laughs> I taught in auditoriums where there were 500 students. Uh, I know what 500 is. There were there were there was more like four to five thousand people present on Parliament Hill. They completely filled the space. The CBC is out to lunch, uh, and uh, I don't know why. How, how maybe they were there just at the beginning as people were arriving and <laughs> it took a quick count and then went away. Um, they certainly didn't report on what has happened because on what happened there because the speeches were amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so there there are more and more people who are organizing and speaking out. Um, I think there is a, a large silent majority of people. I don't know if it's a majority, but there's a large silent fraction that understand that the, the whole masking thing is, is a bit crazy, makes no sense, uh, that it makes no sense that they lost their job, that it makes no sense that the government keeps insisting and repeating this, this nonsense that you constantly hear. Um, you know, propaganda kind of backfires when you have to say it too much, when you have mm -hmm. to insist too much, when you have right. to keep inventing new mantras, it, it starts to backfire after a while. And I think that's happening to, to a large degree. I hope that there will be a turnaround point and that uh, some politicians will be able to take advantage of it and uh, um, um, recruit people uh, as uh, political followers that are th these people who are more, uh, you know, suspicious of the propaganda and so on. So I hope that that will play a role and that we'll turn this thing back. It's, you know, uh, there, there is an example of this kind of propaganda that has been turned back in recent history. Uh, for example, globalization is the solution to everything. If you have globalization, everyone on the planet will be healthy and wealthy. Um, and, the, you know, that's been the mantra of all the financial influencers, the global influencers, and it's been on the lips of all our politicians and everything. And uh, we have to globalize, globalize, and so on. 
and 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 that eventually led to we have to save the planet from carbon and so on. Well, it's gone too far, and the result is that there are now strong political movements that want to make the national economy strong again, mm-hmm. that want to bring back the democracy that exists in a nation country, that want to not follow. Uh, these global uh, mantras and so on. And so we saw that with with Brexit and the Yellow Vests and Trump and movements like that. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that even these these extremely well-oiled and well-funded propaganda campaigns can fail because because people know that this uh, plan is not helping them. In fact, they're hurting more and more. And so political movements that oppose this, these, these um, global campaigns start to develop. We, we've seen it before, we've seen it recently, and it can happen again with this, with this uh, uh, health, uh, what I would call a health dictatorship. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, can, we can see it happening again. I, 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 I hope that that's what will happen. But I can tell you that it's not going to happen as a gradual process. My guess is it will be a nonlinear phase transition in a sense. That's what a physicist would say. Right. You know, it will be very sudden. It, there'll, be, there'll be like a, a kind of a collapsing domino effect, you know, and, and all of a sudden it will not be cool for politicians to say that we should listen to the World Health Organization and so on, you know, hmm. and uh, it'll, it'll kind of disappear because stronger political parties that are more, that, that are not aligned with these schemes uh, will have too much influence that you, you just can't go there anymore. So I think there will be some nonlinear reactions eventually. Uh, but right now we're in the middle of a, an ocean of propaganda. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was actually going to be my next question to you. Like, what were your thoughts on how all of this will play out? So it's good to hear that you do have some hope that eventually things will snap back. Um, we talked about this on some of our uh, other shows regarding COVID. Do you have any more COVID-related research in the works? Oh, yeah. Like I said, uh, we have streams of research in the works. Um, there's one research that is examining uh, why uh, mortality, yearly mortality, has started increasing and has been continuously increasing in many, many countries starting in 2008 after the last big financial restructuring mm-hmm. and crash and everything. So we've observed that in a lot of the data and we're looking into why that is, you know, is it, is it partly can, you know, can uh, a baby boom effect be ruled out? We believe so, you know, that it cannot be explained by the pyramid of, of ages and so on. And uh, so we're looking into that. We're looking at, we're doing a special on just Sweden and its, and its neighbors. I, I alluded to that earlier. Um, I'm, I'm, I want, we want to do a special on Canada because you can compare province to province and it's really fascinating what you see there. And we're doing a big special on uh, the United States because the differences from jurisdiction to jurisdiction there are really stunning. Mm. And also it gives you a baseline to see um, what typically the winter burden mortality is really and in what bounds statistically it lies with and has lied for decades and that you know and, and unless you've got something that gets you out of that distribution of normalcy even though it is death it is normal deaths uh then you can't talk about a particularly virulent pathogen and so we're we're, we're developing all of those concepts and our our method of analysis of the epidemiological data is more advanced, I believe, than what epidemiologists have been doing so far because epidemiologists have been using a kind of sinusoidal variations of that cycle, which we, we argue is, is incorrect because the shape is not sinusoidal and the sinusoidal doesn't capture uh, a true background uh, that would exclude the viral respiratory disease fraction. So we have developed an analysis where we analyze in terms of winter burden deaths, where we, we can show that the summer troughs vary very regularly and uh, that it is the everything above the summer trough that should be counted 
and that you cannot discriminate what's happening within that winter burden, uh, that, it's, that it's virtually impossible to do so mathematically. Um, and so we uh, adopt an, an interpretation of that type and we find that the, the um, numbers that come out are, are um, less susceptible to error are, are robust basically, and can really be looked at and their statistics can be studied. So we're, we're, we're just moving forward. We're just going as fast as we can trying to get this research out. That's great. Yeah. So I have, I have a question that's kind of more of an opinion type question. Um, but when you look at this at the, from the big picture, kind of looking at everything that has happened um, and looking at it from your, um, you know, really digging into the research and actually seeing the numbers and all that sort of thing. Do you think that this is, was just kind of like a comedy of errors where it was one mistake after another, people overreacting to different things? Or do you see, do you see some kind of like purpose in this, something nefarious? Well, um, my vision, thanks for that question. My, my vision of that question is based on my research on uh, geopolitics. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a large paper, um, which we haven't talked about, which is which was about the geopolitics of globalization since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And so there were two major events that happened. One was uh, the US un unanimously opted out of the Bretton Woods Agreement in the, in the early 70s, and that transformed the world. Uh, and that was the first big cycle of globalization controlled by uh, Western powers centered in the United States. And then the next really huge acceleration of globalization occurred um, at, the, at the point where the Soviet Union disintegrated. Mm -hmm. So the early 90s, 1992 roughly, the early 90s was the, was the next big turning point in this so-called globalization, which means financial and resource globalization. And uh, that, that, that cycle, that second cycle, which was huge, and I, we have studied it in detail, and looked at all kinds of data that shows that big turning point, and also um, the uh, official documents of the, of the United Nations and of various uh, state legislatures and so on. So I, I wrote a big paper about that. And uh, what we found was that um, in addition to this, this, this really aggressive globalization in terms of m monopolizing uh, the big corporations and the big financial uh, interests and so on, and, and really bringing, bringing uh, the world that could be controlled by the US-centered uh, enterprise into alignment and even being more vicious than previously uh, regarding the allies, so Japan and, and, and Europe and so on. Um, it was also accompanied by ideological uh, newness. So at the same time in the early 90s, you had an environmental movement that was born out of thin air. Okay, so there were these global conferences, the Earth Day and so on that uh, started telling us that um, carbon was going to destroy the planet. Right. And you, at, the, at the same time, you had uh, NGOs, which are these private, uh, you know, money-funded, uh, non-democratic entities acquired the status of a person with rights and a say at the UN. Okay, this happened at the same time. And at the same time, you had... Um, gender equity that became something disproportionate in the sense that it was not about that child uh, where children were being killed in wars and were being brought in as soldiers and were being used as sex slaves. It was that female children were being exploited in this way. And the UN became all about the female child being exploited in, in this way around the world. And, and, it, and what became important was that you had your, all the Senate you had to have as many female Senate members as male Senate members and as many female government. And that became like the, the new kind of thing. And that, that led to a new, a new uh, wave of feminism uh, that became really important and overtook a lot of academia. And at the same time, at the very same time, and this was, this was, each had its own international conference that happened in the early 90s, was the anti-racism movement but a new kind of anti-racism movement. So it was no longer about 
it was no longer about um, you can't have discrimination, you can't exploit uh, weaker countries, you can't exploit entire regions just because you have a, a military presence there. It was no longer about those kinds of really big and vile uh, exploitations, but it became uh, about uh, equally about um, racism in the language, racism in thought and attitude. Mm -hmm. And at the same, and, and the academia was geared in that same direction, led by the World Health by the, sorry, by the UN, okay? So racism became racism of thought. Racism, it, it was no longer primarily stopping the actual mega crimes against humanity and stopping the actual uh, harms, the physical harms that were happening. So this all happened and you can follow it. And I wrote a huge paper about this uh, as one of the reports for the Ontario Civil Liberties Association. Um, which got covered in the media, uh, at least the alternative media, quite a lot. So that is the context that I understand this in. Mm -hmm. And in that context, what has happened recently is that it's becoming more and more clear that China with Russia and some others, Eurasia, is developing and is understanding that it needs to dissociate itself financially, it cannot be controlled by the US centered system. And so it is standing up. And uh, that standing up is very real, and is very strong, and is very regular. And um, there is a rise. And that is, uh, so the world is going from being uh, a hegemony to uh, being a, a, a at least bipolar world. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is freaking out the um, the US system and the mega financiers that manage a lot of how the world is occupied, they are freaking out because the, the, the US dollar will no longer be uh, the global currency, which has been the basis, the, the kind of the me mechanistic basis of that exploitation. And so they're looking for something else. And one of the big ways to solve this problem is to enforce a carbon economy uh, and to have uh, currency tied to carbon and to control that. Um, so that has explained the drive for this, for this whole carbon madness. Um, another, and, but what, so they're trying to create as many ties as they can to uh, their currency and, and, things that they want to be real in the world. See, they can't control energy like they used to. The problem with fossil fuels is there's way more of them than you can control on the planet, okay? So you've got Venezuela, you've got Russia, you've got Canada, you've got all these places can discover more fossil fuels. China can uh, buy coal from uh, and, and get coal and has coal. Uh, coal and fossil fuel are extremely abundant on the planet. And so it's no longer a question of just controlling the Middle East. So the Middle East model is failing, uh, which is why Israel is nervous, I think, also. Uh, and they should be. Um, so you can't, uh, you, you, they want to control it, and they, and they do things to control the price of fossil fuel, they don't want their competitors, Russia and Venezuela, to benefit from a high price of fossil fuel, but they need a high price of fossil fuel to prop up the US dollar as a world currency. So what they need is they need as many, um, they need as many uh, tangible things or things made tangible that are tied to a currency that they control. So they want an e-currency that's tied to carbon or or they want, um, currency is also largely tied, the US dollar has been tied to the opium trade, which is why you have the occupation in Afghanistan, okay? They, that, that's a big part of propping up the dollar. Um, the other big thing that could uh, prop up this e-currency that they're thinking of installing as the global currency would be a dependence on uh, the pharmaceutical industry for health and survival. So if they can convince us that everyone must have one or, or several vaccines every year, and it's a question of human survival, and that uh, all governments should be paying for this, 
and that they should be enforcing this and that you need to have an electronic passport to prove that you have had your vaccines or else you cannot travel, you cannot have a business, you cannot live basically in the world without this, then they have created yet another thing that they control, that they produce, that they sell, that it gives value to their new e-currency, okay? So they, whatever, whatever global currency you want to install, it has to be tied to something that is believed to be real or that is real, such as fossil fuel, opium, uh, the armament, armaments themselves. If you've got a racket like the US has had, which is to uh, sell overpriced military equipment protection to the allies, then you've got a way to ensure that they need US dollars to buy that protection in the form of overpriced military equipment that often doesn't work. Um, so, these are, the, these are the rackets that sustain a global currency that in turn is the mechanism for global exploitation. So as long as they can keep China, Russia in line, and if, as long as they can impose themselves financially in this way, they can continue to control the world. And so I think a lot of this is in play here. And I think that um, vaccines and pharma like genetically modified uh, crops and so on, same kind of deal. Uh, all of these things are about controlling the world. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of it. Yeah. And so the the whole COVID business was essentially just an extension of that, just kind of a yeah, it's just one one of one of many campaigns along those lines. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the global warming campaign, which becomes the climate campaign. You've got all these all these campaigns. And at the same time, you're keeping all the uh, professional and middle class managers of the empire preoccupied with uh, anti-racist language mm -hmm. and and uh, gender equity in every workplace. And, uh, you know, whether or not we're our carbon footprint is too big. So you've got everybody uh, ideologically aligned with that and it becomes, it becomes okay to have a military campaign, uh, you know, uh, intervene to protect, you know, if someone wants to burn too much coal or uh, not have gender equity or whatever, uh, then it becomes okay. It, everything everything that, that the empire does in the world is seen through the filter of those glasses. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a national religion for the empire to have this wonderful anti-racist, politically correct language and to be completely obsessed with that. Um, so it all kind of fits together in that way. And, and it's, it's, it's social engineering and all our institutions participate in it and all our institutions follow um, the suggestions and directives uh, of the United Nations and uh, the World Health Organization, because these uh, institutions have traditionally been controlled. But with the new, now, now what has happened is that those finance centers are in competition with more nationalist industry in the United States. That's why you've got the Republican Democrat battles and that's why you've got the trump phenomenon is because uh trump's financial base if you like is more tied to the military and military armament industry which is domestic and also uh domestic uh fossil fuel production which is really big now in the united states uh, so uh the, the the national industry interests are have been have been tied to trump and that is a very real and important movement because it wants to ensure that the middle class in the, Uni in the United States is treated well and does well. And that becomes the political um, uh, basis for a nationalist Trump-like movement, okay? So you've got an opposition between that and the truly globalized finance centers that are more tied to the CIA and so on, mm -hmm. um, that uh, want to don't don't care about the middle class in the United States or in any Western country really. 
they only care about the professional and managerial classes that they need and, um, and a complete control of everything. So they made the mistake of ignoring the middle class too much, the working, the working and middle class. And uh, so now we have this very real battle. I don't, I don't buy this thing that um, it's controlled opposition and that the Democrats and the Republicans presently are, are just two facets of the same thing. To some degree, that's true, but to a large degree, there's a very real political war going on. Uh, and it's about these very two different visions of how can a strong nation, how can the empire be strong? And uh, uh, Trump et al. are saying you need a strong middle class and working class. You need, you need the domestic culture and people and economy to be strong if you want to be a leader in the world. And the globalists have forgotten that. They've forgotten that they need a base because they're, they can live anywhere and they, they can just uh, be well by taking care only of the, of the elite. Uh, circles, okay, as long as they control things. So that's the kind of thing that I, that's the way I understand it. That's the way I see it. Well, thanks for that, because yeah. we don't hear many people connecting the dots regarding COVID and the whole global agenda that is taking place right now. That's something that we try to do on this show, but that was a pretty excellent answer. Right? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. It's not something I've, I've written the paper about globalization. I've written papers about COVID in a rigorous paper. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, did we... Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I think we lost you for a second there. Okay, sorry. We heard you say you were, uh, you've were. you written papers about... Yeah, I, I've written and studied the globalization and the history of it. I've, I've written and studied covid and the masks and and the virology the epidemiology but i never connected the two in a in a scientific paper i never mm. did you know i never wrote it down and spelled it out but you asked for my opinion so there it is yeah <laughs> no that was great um i don't know if i have any any more questions tiff did you have anything else that you well, wanted to ask just do you have a website or a place where all of your research is collated in one spot or where can our listeners I wish find you know I, I should research I should get a, a, a website or something but um I have listed there is I have a blog that I've had for many years where I made a blog post listing all the links to my covid related research and that blog is activistteacher.blogspot.com you probably find a list of links there. The place where I'm publishing most of this science stuff these days is ResearchGate. Mm -hmm. So almost everything is there except the one that they deplatformed <laughs> because the masks, the, the the masks don't work article, which was so popular, had <laughs> four four hundred thousand reads on ResearchGate, unseen before. Uh, they took it down, and they when I challenged them on it, they said it was because it was being read too much. It was having too much influence. Basically, that's what it meant. And I made their letters to me public, and that's been written about in the media and so on. But that's the only one that they've dared to deplatform. All my other scientific research is still on ResearchGate. Um, so the globalization papers on ResearchGate. Uh, so all the, all the big serious reports and scientific uh, articles are on ResearchGate. And I do have to definitely um, plug your uh, Twitter as well, because oh, yeah. I, was, I was very impressed as I was scrolling through it. I'm like, we could have been talking to you about uh, climate change or Julian Assange or critical race theory or, you know, a, a whole number of different things where I was like, wow, he, you know, this guy is on point with everything. So <laughs> if you, if yeah, you I, want a good, a good Twitter stream to follow, you should follow. You're just Denis Rancor on there, right? Rancor? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, one word, Denis Rancor. And um, no, that's right. I mean, I wrote critical pieces about critical race theory, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a decade ago. I was, I was saying, this is, this is obscene. This is crazy. Uh, this, is, this is not right. And I was not the only... Uh, academic to say that there have been some heavy duty academics who have said this makes, you know, this is wrong. 
and um, and I've reviewed their work and so on. And I've been writing about it. And in my book, I only wrote wrote one book about anti-racism. I I'm very critical of critical race theory. Uh, but then um, I was pleasantly surprised to see Trump mm -hmm. deciding to explicitly defund critical race theory in universities and in institutions. And I mean, I had a mini party when I saw that. <laughs> we, I, um, <laughs> and, you know, I only understood how vile critical race theory is when I studied the geopolitics, uh, the history of geopolitics. And when I saw how it was initiated, what it was tied to, uh, like I reviewed earlier in the show here today. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And you have a YouTube channel as well. I do, yeah. Uh, so people can find you. You do uh, just kind of a number of um, commentaries um, type videos there. And yes. That, that also is just uh, Denis Rancourt? Uh, or yep. Denis? Okay. That's right. YouTube channel Denis Rancourt. And um, yeah, and I have a, a list, a playlist there of everything I could find where I'm being interviewed about uh, COVID-19 or masks. So there's a playlist about COVID-19 on my YouTube channel. Um, yeah. And there's, yeah, there's various things there. I don't have time to do very much of it because I'm, I'm giving my time to interviews. Yeah, and yeah. So I'm, happy to, I'm happy to see other people yeah. doing that, yeah. you know? Well, we're very glad that you did um, because this was, this was great. I'm, Thank you very much for, for joining us today. It was my uh, my pleasure, Doug and Tiffany. It was really wonderful to be with you guys. I did all the talking, but hey, that's the way it goes. Great. <laughs> that's great. That's the best kind of guest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks for joining us, everybody, today. Um, be sure to like and subscribe, and uh, we will be back next week with another exciting show. Talk to you soon. Bye.